Hello there, welcome to the marketplace. Coming up uh, in the next 30 minutes, the cost of certain foodstuffs and housing pushes August inflation to 9.7%. We have all the details regarding this statistic. Also, Ghana would have to pay more interest to investors if it goes to the international markets to borrow to finance the budget. We'll tell you the reasons why. Plus, we monitor the situation in Guinea as international business consultant predicts trade effects between Ghana and Guinea. We have all these coming up shortly. Do stay with us. Hi, this is Lexus Bill, host of Drive Time on Joy 99.7 FM. Listen, you don't have to worry if you miss Drive Time or personality profile. It's going to be live on our podcast page. Just log on to www.myjoyonline.com forward slash podcast you can listen to drive time personality profile and any other of your favorite shows on joy fm on that page you don't have to miss a show at all joy 99.7 fm radio for discerning listeners Hey, welcome. I'm Charles Ait. To our first story, high cost of certain foodstuffs and housing pushed the rate of inflation for the month of August to 9.7% and near the upper limit of the target band. However, it still remains in the single-digit bracket despite the consistent upward trend in the prices of some foodstuff and housing. Addressing journalist, government statistician Professor Samuel Kobuna Ening said the situation is worrying. We look at the composition of year-on-year -year inflation, keeping in mind the 13 divisions, and we continue to see that food inflation is contributing the, the largest to the overall inflation of 9.7 that was recorded for the month of August 2021. For the first time in several months, we've seen the contribution of food inflation surpassing 50%, specifically 50.2%. We also see housing maintaining its contribution at 16.7, and we see a, a marginal dip in transport of about 0.3%, that is reducing from 14.3 that was recorded for the month of July 2021 and 14.0 recorded for the month of August 2021. Combining housing and food inflation, we are accounting for two thirds of the overall inflation that was recorded for the month of August 2021, and combining food, housing, and transport for faith of the overall inflation are drawn from these three um, divisions, with food 50.2%, housing 16.7%, and transport 14.0%. We do the disaggregation at the subclass level on a year-on-year -year basis and on a month-on-month -month basis, focusing on food in the view that food is the major driver for the August 2021 um, inflation. From a year-on-year -year basis, we identify seven subclasses that record food inflation higher than the overall um, average, that is the 10.9, that was recorded for the month of August um, 2021. And from the month-on-month -month basis, we identify nine subclasses that do record food inflation, that, that do record inflation higher than the overall food inflation of 0.2. Specifically, we see cocoa drinks and cereal products from both a year-on-year -year basis and a month-on-month -month basis leading on the chart of higher rates of inflation, specifically with 15.7 and 15.5 respectively for cocoa drinks and cereal products on a year-on-year -year basis and 12.3% for cocoa drinks and 2.8% for cereal products on a month-on-month -month basis. We record a deflation for water ready-made food items and vegetables on a month-on-month -month basis. And largely, these three um, subclasses are what is driving the 0.2 um, food inflation that we did record for the month of August um, 2021. We do a trend analysis, again, from, by comparing food and non-food inflation on a year-on-year -year basis and also do same on a month-on-month -month basis. For the second consecutive time, we see that food inflation has dominated non-food inflation with a wider gap of about 2.2%. Meanwhile, the Greater Accra region is back to its position as the, as the region with the highest rate of inflation for the month of August, a position it lost to the northern region in the previous month. Eastern region, however, remains the region with the lowest inflation rate. Let's break it all down for you with some statistics and highlights of the month in perspective. 
And of course, uh, we shall show you that in detail, but we're joined by Zoom, uh, by, uh, by Zoom by Edward Carriwe, the General Secretary of the General Agric Workers Union, for some analysis of a trend which indicates that food has been a driver for inflation for some time now. We're so grateful that you could join us. Uh, I could see you on the ground, mm -hmm. but help us understand, what do you make of the latest statistics? Well, let me say good afternoon to all of you and to all the people who are listening to us. Um, what we have seen about the statistics is the true reflection of what is on the ground, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, different from what we have been hearing, that uh, uh, there's no cause for alarm so far as uh, uh, food production and food availability is concerned in this country. So therefore, is the trend a matter of concern, considering the fact that some foodstuffs are driving the rate up? Yeah, certainly. You know, um, if you look at the basket, there are a number of things that actually constitute the food uh, and the inflation, or I mean, determine the inflation. And food is uh, is major. So if the prices of food stuffs are going up continuously, certainly it will drive up in, uh, up inflation, and that is what is being reflected or is available uh, for us to see. And I think that the statistician. Uh, made it clear that it's a worrying situation and that uh, this is not what we had expected. Particularly, it's not the case that around this time of the year, uh, we have so much uh, lack of food and then uh, culminating into uh, food prices going up the way they are today. But what, when you look at the value chain, uh, Mr. Kari, well, of course, there are some hiccups there from the farm gate to the market centers. What exactly can be done to address this matter of the food production value chain once again so that it doesn't build up to the cost? Well, we all know about these issues. We know that the roads to the uh, uh, farm gate is very bad. I am just in the north now. I've gotten start on the farms because I try to go to the farms. Other people have also gotten stuck. Even the tractors, which came to try to bring us out, also got stuck. So the roads to the farm gates are very bad. And then again, uh, if you, we, the way we also transport our food to the uh, market centers is not also well organized. So we just need a holistic you know, uh, overview to ensure that when food we map up where there's food in each district, where the farm gates are, and then how we are going to transport that farm, uh, the food from the farm gate to the urban centers, to the market centers, and then to where it is most needed. And that we will now know the challenges as they pertain in each case or in each district, in each region, and then we should address that. And once we do that, certainly we'll have a situation uh, uh, change. Now Especially when you're on the ground, I want to pose this question to you because we do know that the Agric Ministry, the minister, you know, in that regard, made mention about the provision of fertilizer to farmers up north. What is the situation now having to also attach the recent, you know, flooding there? How is the situation now regarding the upscale of farmers with the acquisition or, you know, the procurement of, of, of fertilizers to them? Well, let me say that for the past, uh, since Friday, the rains have not been heavy within the northern sector, particularly upper east and so on. And then uh, the ground is getting dry, and that is good for the crops. If uh, after one week the rains come and they don't come in a torrential uh, manner, it will, it will be okay. The fertilizer availability is, at this time, is not a solution because fertilizer application is time bound. So uh, there's little that people can now do with uh, fertilizer. And the only fertilizer that is actually being needed now is the uh, urea, or which we sometimes also call the ammonia fit uh, or whatever. You know, that it's, it's that fertilizer. And that one is only meant for crops that are tussling, like you talk about the base, you talk about the... Whether he's up north on his farm, given us, you know, his assessment of the statistics, which, you know, makes it clear that food inflation has inched up 
you know, in August. But as mentioned earlier, the Greater Accra is back to its number position. Its position as a region with the highest rate of inflation for the month of August, a position it lost to the northern region in previous month. Eastern region, however, remains the region with the lowest rate of inflation. And uh, let's hear from the government statistician, Professor Samuel Kopuna Ene. We see that the three regions, that is northern, upper east, and upper west, have rates of, have rates of food inflation which are continuing to show an upward trend, specifically with northern region showing 21.5%. And this connotes about a, about a three times difference between the regions that are recording the lowest food inflation, specifically eastern region and um, western region that respectively recorded 5.2 food inflation for the month of um, August 2021. From a non-food point of view, we continue to see Greater Accra recording the highest non-food inflation of 13.4%, followed by Northern Ashanti region, respectively recording 10.3 10, 10 and 9.7. Putting food and non-food inflation together, we see the dominance of Northern region giving the very high food inflation of 21.5%. So overall food inflation, we see Northern region recording the highest overall inflation of 14.5%, with Eastern Region recording the lowest inflation of 3.0%. The least inf inflation recorded, by, recorded from Eastern Region is largely driven from Eastern Region recording the least non-food inflation of 1.0 and the least food inflation of 5.2. Focusing on Northern Region from the overall inflation perspective and from the food perspective, the main drivers of inflation in the, in the Northern Region overall inflation were transport, which led with 26.3, food and non-alcoholic beverages, 21.5, and information and communication, 15.5. From the food perspective, we see the following cereal products, vegetables, and tea, res respectively recording 41.2, 26.8, and 18.9 for the month of August 2021, culminating in the 21.5 food inflation that was recorded for the northern region. And we have highlights that we shall be showing you on your screens regarding the statistics uh, for the month in perspective. Uh, of course, we start with the statistics, uh, which you can see from your screen, the disaggregation of August 2021 rates of inflation. Food inflation was 10.9%. The average over the last 12 months was 10.4%. So you can see the inch up there. The month-on-month -month food inflation was 0.2%. And this is all from the Ghana Statistical Services CPI release. It goes further on when it comes to the non-food inflation we're looking at 8.7%. Last month was that of 8.6%, so a 0.1 increase. The average uh, over last 12 months was that of 8.8%. The month-on-month non-food inflation was also 0.3%. Uh, All, you know, are tuning to the fact that the overall inflation inched up a bit in the month of August. Well, it goes on to help us understand the fact that inflation for locally produced items was 10.3%. Inflation as well for imported items was 8.1%. So this gives us a clear understanding of, you know, the cost of uh, the, the rate in which the cost of, you know, goods and services are inching up across board, not just in the greater Accra region. And for those of you interested to know the highlights, you know, from the statistician's submission, the fact that year-on-year -year inflation for August was 9.7%. The month-on-month -month between July to August was 0.3%. The year-on-year -year variation between food and non-food inflation was 2.2%. We shall keep an eye on these figures to give you access to much more information regarding the implications moving forward. But away from that, Ghana will have to pay more interest to investors if it goes to the international market to borrow to finance the budget. That's according to the head of finance at the Value View University, Dr. William Supra. The country's balance sheet, that is our assets and liabilities, is weaker because of our very high debt. International ratings agency Moody's has affirmed that Ghana's B3 long-term issuer ratings and also kept our economic outlook at negative. It attributes that to the high burden, the high debt burden, continued weak debt affordability, the high gross borrowing requirement, as well as ongoing liquidity challenges. Dr. Prepa joins us via Zoom with more uh, on this. Uh, we're so grateful, Dr. You could join us. First of all, what your ba what's the basis to your session? Um, good afternoon, and um, I'm also, um, I wish your viewers very well. 
Um, my, the basis for this assertion um, is based on the fact that uh, Moody's um, rating is, um, has put Ghana at a B3 and also a negative outlook. Um, if you look at what Moody's is saying or the work they have done, um, they are saying that um, Ghana's bond, normally, um, let me give an explanation a little bit of the work they do. So they first look at our ability to pay our debt when they become due and then the social uh, out, uh, outlook of the country. So with the ability to pay our debt, um, they see uh, in the future there will be challenges for Ghana. Moody is saying that um, from 2022 to 2025, Ghana will require about $1 billion every year to service its debt. Um, currently, um, the country um, debt exposure to GDP is above 80%. Um, which says that um, our balance sheet is not very strong to be able to um, pay these debts. And um, if next year, 2022 to 2025, the country requires $1 billion to be paying only um, debt, um, it, that is why I'm saying that our balance sheets or our books are not very good to support this payment. And it's the reason why Moody's puts Ghana bonds as highly speculative. Um, when a bond is highly speculative, it means that the country must entice um, investors more to be able to um, um, bring in more funding um, when you go to the international market. So that is the, the first part of the, of the issue. Um, our debt exposure is high and the, the rate we are paying is also very high. And on the issue of um, the negative outlook for Ghana, um, normally the assessment is done on three main areas. First is the social side, the economic side, the environmental side and governance side. So on the social side, uh, Moody's is saying that Ghana has issue with housing, infrastructure, and then education. So you just see that the, the Saska service is supporting that there's high cost in housing, which is um, pushing the inflation high. So it, it's, it's, it's a confirmation of what Moody's is saying. And that's why we are saying that. Um, and also uh, your housing is your, uh, your greatest asset. So if you are having a high time, challenging your assets, and this exposure is weakened, then your, the country's balance sheet is not very strong. What it simply means is that our infrastructure development is on the very low side. Um, in, in, in the past, um, Ghana spent about 2% of our budget in, on our infrastructure development, which is not very good uh, as a country. So our, the, the exposure of, of, on the social side is a negative um, effect. When it comes to the environment, too, um, you, we are aware of what is happening in the mining sector and um, cocoa farming, the practices that um, farmers are using now is not very sustainable. The weather is, as you were just discussing, the weather is not conducive for, uh, for us as a country now. So there's an anticipation that um, our food basket will suffer, which we have seen that the cost of food is one of the main drivers of inflation. And lastly, uh, Moody's put that one also as very high. And lastly is governance. Um, Moody's rated our governance system as moderate. When you say moderate, I mean, because we change, and we have been able to change, gov uh, voted and change government successively, and without major issues, um, they see Ghana as well stable. But we know what happened during the election um, 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 times. And we are not anticipating that um, in 2024, there will be much um, issues, but the country needs to improve in terms of governance. The governance area cuts through a lot of issues, corruption issues, and the rest, which we know what is happening in the country. Mm. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big issue for, for us as a country Indeed. to be paying one billion Indeed, one and, billion and for those and for billion. those and for those watching and for those uh, watching, Doctor, the question remains: How do we fix this in the medium to long term? If if, if we are to disaggregate most of the things you're stating and you know categorize them under those that can be mitigated and the unavoidable ones, how do we balance the risk? And of course, moving forward, how do we fix it from the medium to long term? I mean, if the first part, which relates to um, the, the debts that we, we, we have taken as a country, um, if you have to look at the, our debt profile and try to put in a proper um, portfolio to how the debts that we have taken this structure, where has the funds been spent is a major issue. Um, about 80% of the monies we have raised, evidence is that 
has gone into consumption, which is a major issue for us. So can we say that going forward, um, all the all the monies we will borrow from outside will go into investment that will repay itself, and also to increase our our tax revenue collection, and that is where Ghana is lacking. I mean, um, if you check, uh, only few people are paying taxes in Ghana. We are hoping that with the coming in of the um, the Ghana card, where now we are seeing that we have about 19 million Ghanaians on, on that on, on that card as um, taxpayers. How many people of them are really paying taxes? Mm. That is where the government must focus on. There are a lot of artisans, in, in my opinion, who do a lot of work, collect a lot of um, high charges, but they don't pay taxes. Can we have um, an approach or system to be able to ask these artisans to pay taxes so that right. our revenue will improve? So, so spreading the tax nets to improve revenue mobilization. You also indicated that the authorities must rationalize expenditure and do more to grow the revenue base from about 13% to GDP to 20%. How do we do that? Um, this is very critical. Um, the, the, uh, I, I mentioned that 80% um, of especially the money that we have borrowed have gone into um, expenditure and uh, they are not, um, let me put it, recurrent expenditure. Um, paying salaries and the rest. Um, government must make sure that um, once the revenue mobilization goes up, you put you put in a lot of strategies to to reduce the excess in, in in making unnecessary payments. Um, though we have the Financial uh, Management Act, um, which government must follow in making payment, but we see that there are some loopholes. So government must strengthen the hands of the of the Financial Management Act and make sure that we do the full implementation. And um, recently we've noticed that, um, I think it was also Parliament mentioned, it, some of the government agencies and, 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 and schools or institutions do payment outside the, the Financial Management Act. And the Financial Management Act put a system in place where all payments are done according to budgets. All but right. um, we see that this is not strictly followed. So we have to make sure that this act is strictly um, and adhered to and those in governance or in heads of institutions uh, follow the, 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 the management act of making payments. And the last one is procurement. Um, we have a good procurement law, but this enforcement is also a problem. Mm. So as a country, if you are not able to control our, our, our uh, follow the procurement law, and that is the only way to control the expenditure. There are two ways, procurement and budget. So the budget is handled by the financial management and the uh, procurement act also take care of that. Great. So as a country, we have to make sure that we, we follow them. Um, uh, there's Great. evidence of a lot of sole sourcing nowadays and you cannot get value for money in such activities. And that is why we have high expenditure as well. And we shall see how the outlook looks like. Uh, of course, we're so grateful, Dr. Willans, head of finance at the Valley View University for your analysis on uh, Moody's uh, outlook on Ghana. But away from that, questions have been raised regarding the trade effects of Guinea's coup on trade and business between the country and its trade neighbors in the ECOWAS sub region. Business development and international consultant Ohineba Kwame Dako believes that political instability in Guinea has a dire effect on trade between Guinea and Ghana. According to him, the coup could increase the cost of trade since the new military leader could restrict entry into the country. The coup leader said there's going to be a closure of the borders. So automatically, if you are trading and you use the borders, you can't go. That's the first thing. That's the first thing. You, 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 you can never go. Even if you are given exception to move, there'll be a lot of inspections at the borders. So that would also impair the time of trading. So if you are allowed, and maybe the product you are sending is perishable, Maybe they have to stay at the borders for maybe a, a day or two because they have to do thorough inspections because now security instability, they, they might fear that maybe there could be guns, there could be whatever to come and do another counter coup. So now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of checks, even if you're allowed. So yes, it's going to have an effect on our trade. And I don't even think you can fly to Guinea now.
Well, President Okufuado has expressed the government's commitment to improve Ghana's business climate for firms to grow and improve the livelihood of Ghanaians. According to him, this is in line with realizing the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda. He was speaking at the maiden edition of Spark Up, an investment summit organized by the Ghana Investment Promotion Center at the Ministry of Information. President Ekufuado is restoring hope to businesses as he emphasized his government's pledge to improve the business environment for firms to expand and employ more Ghanaians. He said this when he gave the opening remarks at GIPC summits dubbed Spark Up. Government since 2017 has put in place measures needed to reduce the cost of doing business, improve the business environment, and made the Ghanaian economy not only one of the most business-friendly economies in Africa, but also one of the fastest-growing economies in the world between 2017 and 2020, averaging 7% GDP annual rates of growth, up from the 3.4% rate we inherited in 2016. The Ghana Investment Promotion Center disclosed that it has targeted $3 billion of foreign direct investments in six areas. They include agriculture, infrastructure, industry, health, and education. Here is Chief Executive of GIPC, Yofi Grant. This year we are targeting $3 billion of um, foreign direct investment. We did mention six areas, um, agriculture, um, infrastructure, industry, technology, health, and education sectors. Yes. I mean, we've been talking about reforms for quite a while and of course the, the important thing is to remove barriers, um, barriers for business and investors and we, one of the barriers that we constantly come across is um, the one of uh, uh, minimum capital requirements. Um, that's one very obvious one that normally happens but there are other areas where we want to streamline and make sure that um, businesses and investors do not suffer inordinately like the number of regulatory hoops they have to go through, the number of agencies they have to go through, uh, better investment facilitation and aftercare service. Meanwhile, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Stephanie Sullivan, has reiterated her country's commitment to maintain ties with Ghana. She indicated that Spark Up is a good initiative to help investors get updates about the investment environment. This is a great opportunity um, for those who are participating uh, to get a, kind of a status report on how the um, investment figures have progressed over the years, uh, including how Ghana has um, continued to sort of fight through the pandemic and to continue its emphasis on uh, direct foreign investment. Uh, the United States is very keen on increasing two-way trade and investment with African countries and Ghana is of course a very important partner in that area. Well, that'll be all for Marketplace. I'm Charles Ait. For more news, you log on to myjohnline.com. Many thanks once again for watching. Enjoy the rest of our programs.